Good evening and, uh, and welcome. Thank you very much for joining us. For those joining us physically, just a very quick bit of housekeeping. Uh, there's no fire alarms planned tonight, no fires planned either. So if the alarm goes off, it is real. The fire exits are just straight through the doors behind you and then out the building to the left with the assembly point just over the road in the park. OK, so very pleased to welcome tonight uh, Giacomo, who's going to talk to us about uh, marine salvage. Um, Giacomo is a naval architect and chartered engineer working as a consultant for Waves Group. He's extensive experience in marine salvage, wreck removal and casualty investigations, having attended projects across Europe, Africa, Asia and South America with broad worldwide experience in marine casualty management, investigation and expert witness work, including collision, elision, fire, stability and strength analysis calculations. He's been engaged by international salvage contractors to attend salvage operations as the team naval architect in environmentally sensitive areas. So I'm sure we'll have a, a very interesting talk. Um, if we could please keep questions to the end of the talk and then we'll deal with questions online at the end. Okay. All right. Jack, thank, thank you very much. You. Thank you very much. All right. Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you very much to attend this lecture on the role of the naval architect in marine salvage. Next slide, please. So today's program will uh, start with a short company introduction, and we will continue with what is marine salvage and the role of the naval architect as a salvor. Then we will see the framework of the modern salvage and the role of the naval architect as a salvage consultant. We'll then see a showcase of project examples, and then we, we will end up with the conclusions. So next slide. I think this is, uh, we can skip this one. There was already an introduction. So uh, who is Waste Group is a firm, is a uh, consultancy firm that specializes in services to the shipping industry and the offshore energy industries. We have offices uh, in the UK, Singapore, Rotterdam, uh, the Netherlands, and uh, the US. Next slide. Our team is uh, regularly um, involved in uh, different types of casualties, such as collision, elision, groundings, and wrecking walls. Next slide. So very brief company introduction. So what is marine salvage? Is the rescue of a ship or its cargo on navigable waters from a peril that, except for the rescuer assistance, would have led to the loss or destruction of property. The rescuer is also known as a salvor. A successful salvor is entitled to a reward, which is a proportion of the total salvage value of the ship and its cargo, and the determining of the set of criteria, such as, as the level of danger encounter and the resources utilized. And the set of criteria are listed in the Article 13 of the International Salvage Convention, which is part of the salvage law. So to break down a little bit more this point, it means that only a salvor that successfully salvage a ship is entitled to a reward. And this reward is a proportion of the salvage value, which means that if the ship initially was valued 100, and then the uh, salvor managed to uh, salvage the uh, the ship for a value of 50, the salvage award can only be up to 50. And of course, the salvage award is only um, given if the salvor is successful. So this principle is is known as no cure, no pay. Who can be a salvor? Well, technically anyone, except with few exceptions. Uh, this might be the um, crew of a ship in trouble, which uh, they managed to get the ship out of trouble, but they cannot make any claim for salvage. It's their role to keep the ship out of trouble. Uh, nowadays, most of the salvage is carried out by professional salvors, or at least uh, the one that you see on the news. Next slide, please. So when assistance is required, the professional salvors will usually dispatch personnel, which will include salvage master and naval architect, which uh, usually will be the team in advance to assess the situation. And then of course, will be this, um, um, uh, mobilize some divers and specialized personnel, depending on the type of casualty. So if there's dangerous, dangerous cargo, uh, specialized personnel for that will be mobilized. And then in terms of assets, uh, usually we'll dispatch some tags, of course, depending on the type of casualty, specialized vessels, for example, crane vessels, and specialized equipment, like for example, hot top equipment or equipment to do underwater cutting. Next slide, please. So there's a vessel in trouble. What the professional software will usually do. First thing first, there will be a situation assessment because any type of casualty will require, will require a different approach. So is that a fire? Is that the heavy listing? Is that the ground with an oil spill? 
those uh, type of accidents require like a different approach. So first, there will be a situation assessment. A salvage master will do an operation assessment. So we'll answer the question, which type of personnel needs to be involved, which type of vessel tags need to be involved, and so the equipment. And then the engineering part of the assessment will be given by the naval architect, which is basically responding the answer, like the question, um, what is the vessel condition? What is stability? What is the structural strength? Uh, what is the residual buoyancy? And so on and so forth. So these will form the inputs for a salvage plan. A salvage plan is a series of actions that will bring the salvage from, like, to salvage the ship. And of course, they will. Uh, this will action you know, into a salvage operation. And the salvage operation can go in two ways: either the ship is salvaged and we deliver to owner, which leads to a salvage award or the ship is lost, which becomes a shipwreck. And so there's no salvage award in theory, but more on this uh, later. Next slide. So we mentioned the naval architect, part of the salvage team. Uh, the main role of the naval, ar naval architect of the Salvor is to verify and assess the engineering, uh, engineering feasibility of a salvage plan. So to do so, the, sub, the naval architect will have to have excellent knowledge on ship structures and stability, will have to elaborate technical assessments often uh, from limited info, and I will add also from limited time, uh, calculation through specialized softwares for strength and stability, and the naval architect will have to have a constant monitoring of the ship condition. That might be uh, from uh, far away if the ship is uh, too dangerous to board, so like checking the draft, for example, or on board, like for example, uh, taking um, uh, sounding measures of the of the ballast water tanks in case you know, like to verify if if the uh, tanks are intact or not, and so on and so forth. Then, of course, uh, will the naval architect in uh, for the salvage team will need to amend and or redraft the salvage plan in case of changing condition of the vessel. It might be that one plan is uh, paramount, like one plan is based on a specific condition of the vessel, and if that change, the plan cannot be, uh, cannot move forward, so it needs to be prepared a new one. Then, of course, in case of a, a successful operation, the uh, naval architect will carry out the structural and stability assessment uh, prior to the vessel redelivery. And of course, the salvers, they, uh, they usually they carry out also wreck removals. So the naval architect in this case will uh, lead the engineering for the wreck removal plan and also during the actual operation. Next slide. So now it's important for the next part of the lecture is important to have a brief overview of what modern salvage is and uh, its, its framework. So nowadays, professional salvors are companies that carry out marine salvage to make a profit. That might be not always the case, but generally speaking, it is the case. So demonstrating a rifle entitlement, entitlement of a salvage award, which if you remember is the Article 13, as mentioned before, may not be a straightforward process. So the risk is that some salvage job could be deemed as not worth it. And of course, no one wants that. So it does a, uh, is there a way to guarantee a salvor that will get the salvage award if it's entitled? Well, the answer is salvage contract, uh, specifically Deloitte's open form, as known as, as, known as LOF, which is a simple two-page contract, uh, a two-page open contract. Open contract means that the parties enter into an agreement, and then the price uh, for the service provider will be uh, decided at the later stage. The price in this case is the salvage award. So the Lloyd Open Forum is based on the same principles of salvage law, so Article 13. Uh, the guarantee is that this agreement is overseen by Lloyd, so it guarantees that the salvor, if it's entitled to a salvage award, will get paid. Uh, the parties, of course, can, uh, can agree on a salvage award in case, in case of successful salvage, or if they do not agree, the case goes to arbitration in London. Again, this is only the case if the salvor is successful. So this contract is a no cure, no pay contract, as you can see on the, on the right hand side on the contract. So, but this is a concept that was uh, in like was uh, um, uh, like came out in the late 1800s, early 1900s. So back then there was not big tankers. So now, of course, like with big ships and and big pollutants on board, the the issue is that the salvors, uh, like the, the the environmental concern is quite quite big. So what about the environment? Well, if a salvor prevented or mitigated damage to the environment, but the ship is lost. 
there's no reward under Article 13. So his efforts or like their efforts of the subwars are not rewarded under Article 13 in case they intervene just to prevent damage to the environment. Next slide. So of course, salvors needs to be incentivized to go after difficult jobs just to mitigate damage to the environment at least. So in 1999, there's the introduction of the special compensation, which is the Article 14 on the uh, International Salvage Convention, which is part of the salvage law. So this special compensation says that if a ship is lost, or well, the salvage award under Article 13 is really low. So it might be that the, that might not even cover the expenses uh, by the salvors. But the salvor prevented or mitigated damage to the environment, some compensation is awarded. So there's too many issue with, issues with this. The first one is that uh, sometimes it's difficult to demonstrate something that didn't happen. So it might be that the ship is lost, but the salvor can claim that thanks to their action, uh, the bunker tanks didn't erupt. Well, it, it might be not that straightforward to demonstrate. But the second issue is that the maximum compensation that can be awarded in under, under Article 14 of the special compensation is just a refund of the expenses that the salvage were in, uh, incur to attempt to salvage the vessel. So there's no profit in that. There's no margin for profit. So it's still not a strong incentive. So the answer was in, the, in 1999 with the introduction of the scopic clause known as special compensation of PNI clubs. So is a remuneration based on tariffs for personnel, assets, and equipment use plus an uplift. So that means that every personnel that is used by the salvor get like a, a daily uh, tariff, a daily charge. So it means that if a salvage ma master is employed for the salvage operation, that's for example is $2,000 per day, or a naval architect is uh, employed for the salvage operation, that's another $2,000 per day. I'm, I'm just uh, um, making numbers just for example. So that's a guarantee amount of money that the salvage will receive for all the equipment used in function of the salvage operation, plus uplift, which that is a straight up profit. The the thing is that scopic compensation can be awarded even if the ship is lost. So it just to incentivize the salvers to go out there and try their best to salvage the vessel, or at least to mitigate damage to the environment. So the LOF, because it's based on the uh, salvage law principle, includes the special compensation by default, but, they, but can be technically superseded by, the sco by scopic if salvors this, decide to include the scopic clause option in the contract. Again, the LOF is a no cure, no pay contract. So the principle is still in place unless the salvor decide to invoke the scopic clause. Next slide. So, as we can see, Scopic is a fallback, a safety net uh, to compensate the salvors for their best endeavor, endeavors in case a salvage award is low or none, so the ship is lost. So in Article 13, salvage award assessment will be still carried out, uh, carried out. If this award is higher than the reward under Scopic, the salvo will be compensated with a higher amount minus a discount, which is about 25% of the difference of the two. This is just like to have like to complete the general information. So, of course, Scopic allows the salvos to be compensated for any resources used. So, in other words, uh, the more is used, the higher the compensation will be. So, there's a, a casualty, and the salvo might call ten tags with the with our which are charged like twenty thousand dollars per day. So, under Scopic, technically, the salvo is entitled to all that amount of money. So, and of course, this is something that no one wants because the Scopic, again, is a safety net for the salvors to attempt a salvage operation. So they really need to use that equipment. So for this, a special casualty representative will, will be usually appointed. So an SCR is a salvage expert that supervises the operation under LOF plus Scopic to guarantee that the resources dispatched and employed by the salvor are necessary for the salvage operation that is being carried out. An SCR must be me a member of the SCR panel at Lloyd's which is uh, like whoever wants to become a member needs to send an application which um, his or her CV will be reviewed uh, regarding salvage and might be accepted as a member or might be uh, uh, declined as a member. So uh, nowadays only 50 members worldwide are part, are members uh, of the SCR panel. So next slide. 
So I do appreciate that like this might be a, little, a lot of information and might not be directly uh, um, like the correlation between the technical part and the commercial part might not be uh, uh, as obvious, but this is really important for what, uh, for what is coming next into the presentation. So of course we talk about LOF and scopic and everything. So a modern salvage operation in theory might look like this. So there's a vessel in trouble, the captain calls a salvor, there's a salvage operation, and it can go either way. The ship is salvaged, re-delivered, or the ship is lost, and there's a shipwreck. Next slide. But in practice, it's a little bit more complicated than that. So there's a vessel in trouble, and the captain calls, well, in the past, it could call a, a, a salvor, but now, now in, like in, in modern times, communication with the shore is really, really uh, doable, feasible. So usually the captain will call the ship owner. Again, this is like a general situation. It might be uh, different. So the ship owner will then call the marine insurance, which uh, they represent the capital that, uh, for the salvage operation if, it needs, uh, if there's a need for one. And then the marine insurance also will appoint lawyers. And when lawyers is involved, like you can understand that like a lot of things might get more complicated. So no offense to any lawyers, I'm sorry. So then there's, uh, the local authorities will uh, contact the, the ship owners to make sure that every action is being taken to manage the salvage operation or the vessel in trouble. So the ship owner then uh, will reach out to a salvor, but then there's the first roadblock, if you will. Uh, what type of contract? Uh, my, it might be an LF, an LF plus copic, a different contract. Uh, that might not be the bread and butter for every ship owner. Uh, you know, like salvage is something that hopefully not everyone, not in the salvage industry needs to deal with regularly. So when that's sorted, uh, there will be a salvage operation. And again, the ship is salvaged. And so there will be a salvage award, but how, uh, how much will be the settlement? How much it, it goes to arbitration? That's another question to, the, uh, to, to resolve. Or the salvage operation, in case it's an LOF, it gets more complicated. Uh, and so like Scopic might be invoked. So there will be an SCR. And again, uh, uh, in this case, the ship is salvaged and there will be a Scopic claim or the ship is lost, becomes a wreck and there's still a Scopic claim. And then again, uh, when the ship becomes a wreck, the local authorities might request a wreck removal. But then again, other question to answer is what to do, how much, which solvers to contact, and then it will be a wreck removal operation. Next slide. So this is quite confusing, but a salvage consultant might come in handy in this situation. So usually a salvage consultant will be appointed by marine insurers. Uh, and then the role of the salvage consultant can be tackled in all these, these points that we see here in the diagram. So for example, on the contract, uh, a salvage consultant can give advice on a technical perspective if what type of contract is best. And then on the salvage operation can give technical advice on, on the principles to make sure that every um, necessary action is being taken by the salvors that are employed. Then uh, for the local authorities, uh, usually a salvage consultant will liaise with uh, local authorities for salvage operation or wreck removal operation just to make sure uh, just to provide to the local authorities that the owner is acting uh, to resolve the issue of a salvage operation or a wreck removal. Then uh, regarding the salvage award, uh, settlement, settlement or arbitration, again, a salvage consultant can provide expert advice uh, on the salvage operation to establish appropriate reward. And the salvage cons consultant can be employed by uh, one party or the other. Of course, like no a conflict of interest must, must exist. Uh, then regarding Scopic, uh, an SCR usually is a salvage consultant, which will provide attendance and supervision of the operation, as we've seen before. And also, uh, it will play an important role on the Scopic claim because we'll provide the report and we'll uh, approve the expenses claimed by, by the, um, by the salvors. And then for wreck removal operations, uh, the, the salvage consultant usually will deal with the process of a wreck removal operation with the ITT process, an invitation to tender, which means that uh, it will gather all the information for the wreck, uh, about the, 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 the wreck to be removed, will distribute it uh, to potential bidders, and then the bidders will send 
uh, proposal for uh, uh, how to remove the vessel and how much it will cost. And the salvage consultant will usually review all these plans and give technical advice on which method would be the most practical for, for uh, the type of wreck. And of course, a salvage consultant will provide an on-site attendance on the wreck room, ab about the wreck removal operation to make sure that what was planned and what was agreed is actually what, what, what is happening. Next slide. So as we can see, the, the big mess from before is a little bit more defined with the involvement of a salvage consultant. So a ship owner, in, uh, which as a vessel in trouble, will call the marine insurers, which also will appoint lawyers. And then marine insurance lawyers and the salvage consultant will exchange information and the salvage consultant will provide technical advice on the operations. Then the salvage consultant will also liaise with local authorities and salvors. There's nothing that prevent the local authority and salvors to, to uh, speak directly, but the salvage consultant will be there to make sure that the um, salvage interests of the owner's side are be represented on site. And then, of course, for the salvage operation, the salvage consultant will provide an uh, oversight on the general operations. And for the requirement, well, there will be a management, a control of the process. Next slide. So, but uh, what is a salvage consultant? So it's a marine consultant that provides expertise and advice on salvage related matters. Of course, that can have, uh, the salvage consultant might have different uh, backgrounds that can be a master, like a former master mariner or a former chief engineer, a former salvage master, but also definitely a naval architect. And in this case, a naval architect will have a similar set of skills as a uh, salvo naval architect will provide independent calculation and assessment about the salvage operation, then will be able to provide specialized technical advice to non-technical stakeholders, and will possess contractual and commercial understanding related to salvage for what we just seen before. Then will attend on site as technical expert and supervise the engineering of the operations. Um, then we'll run the ITT for the wreck removal with the responsibility to provide all the technical info, documents, and drawings to bidders to formalize uh, a, a wreck removal method. And then we'll review the feasibility engineering of different removal methodologies, assessing also the cost involved. And also could be appointed by salvors during an operation. Of course, no conflict of interest must exist. Next slide. So now we are on the fun part. So. Uh, a showcase of project examples that have been directly involved. So this was years ago in Greece, uh, around Christmas time, a vessel crashed into the rocks. There was not much to salvage, so the uh, salvors were appointed to uh, try to mitigate damage to the environment, and then the authorities requested a wreck removal because the ship broke in, in multiple pieces and the, all the pollutants were located in the aft section. It was agreed with the authorities that only the aft section had to be removed. So like the, the necessity here was to review the methodologies that uh, really um, implied a method that was uh, like for, for the wreck, for the, this section to be removed in a safely manner without avoiding any spill of any pollutants that might have remained still on board. So uh, the best method chosen was uh, the lift in one piece through shear leg. Uh, and one of the main things is that when using uh, chains, it might be like chains are also used for big cutting, like to cut big pieces. So one of the important thing is to uh, avoid that, uh, like the wreck is, is rigged on the chains and like the, the the weight of the wreck itself uh, caused uh, caused like the, the cutting of the of a big piece. So it was important to define the points of where these chains were rigged. And also on the right hand side, you can see there's a protection uh, just like uh, um, below the 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 bridge with the bracket because that's like a weak point. So it was uh, put the reinforcement to avoid that the chain will cutting through during the lifting. So next slide. This one was another project, uh, was in Portugal, in the Azores. So it was a passenger ferry that crashed into the rocks. Uh, so again, the salvors uh, first attempt to salvage the vessel, but because the waves coming in into the harbor, uh, like the vessel was like the, 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 the vessel location, the accident location was pretty exposed uh, to the waves. Uh, so the vessel was rocking pretty, pretty heavily. So it, it really turned out to be a wreck pretty, pretty quick. 
So then a record removal and ITC was, was issued uh, and the plan were reviewed and the best plan or like the, the most suitable plan in this case was defined as um, like cutting in situ through guillotine. So guillotine is exactly what it sounds, is a big eye beam in this case with a very sharp end and like let it drop and uh, cutting straight line into, into the rack. So of course, there's a, the, the, the Salvo Naval Architect will pre-plan some cutting lines to, to uh, send the guillotine into, uh, but then it's like piece by piece uh, uh, and cut by cut, um, like basically dismantling, dismantling the vessel. Uh, and of course, because the location, uh, it was important to use a barge because the, the, the draft uh, uh, and the water depth at the location was, was not that, that deep. So it was really, really interesting. Next slide. Another one that I've been involved with uh, was uh, uh, this coaster vessel in, in Turkey. So uh, it was uh, the reason why this vessel sunk was because he'd like a rock in the cargo hold one. The cargo hold one uh, floated and then the ship went, went down. Uh, so uh, a salvor was appointed first to remove all the fuel into, uh, from the vessel to avoid uh, damage to the environment. And then uh, again, an ITT was issued and the most suitable method was uh, to refloat the vessel in, in one piece. So refloating a vessel, uh, especially when it's fully submerged, the principle is easy. You take the water out and the vessel regain buoyancy. Uh, but then in practice is a little bit more complicated. So there was a mitigation procedure in place, which was cut up the vessel if the refloating was too, too complicated because the technical challenge is to make the, the vessel watertight again. So uh, when you pump out water, air has to come in because then you might create a vacuum effect. So if you can see this on the left-hand side, you can see some pipes sticking out uh, from the vessel. And those were the venting pipes where the vessel was on the seabed. These pipes were sticking uh, right uh, above the, the water surface. So the issue though is that something must have gone wrong because one of the pipes got, got uh, clogged. And so the under pressure inside, inside the tanks made uh, the, the hatch cover, the custom made hatch cover have like a plastic deformation. So uh, because the, the, the hatch cover was well designed and well installed, uh, the, the vessel refloated anyway, but it was really, really impressive to see that it was a failure uh, uh, that, that didn't compromise the refloating, the refloating operation. So next slide, please. So this one was another interesting case uh, in Italy. So a ship uh, crashed into the rocks, big hole into the, into the uh, engine room. Uh, and so because of the location and the weight pounding, uh, the vessel uh, was pushed high, high and dry. And of course, it was not accessible in any other way at the time, uh, if not with helicopter. So that was a really nice commute to, to the job site. So first there was a removal, uh, like an oil removal. So the salvors, the appointed salvors transferred the oil into IBC tanks. And then with the helicopter was pick, they were picking like the helicopter picked up these IBC tanks and moved them and shift them into a nearby nearby vessel. It was pretty clear that it, a refloating was not possible. The vessel was too high and dry, but also it was breached everywhere. Cargo hold two was lost, cargo hold three was lost, and a lot of um, ballast water and especially the the engine room. So it was really really unsalvageable. So next slide. And of course, there was a wreck removal, uh, and this was a, a, a really, really interesting method. So um, underwater cutting is usually very, very, uh, not very, sorry, is more complicated than dry cutting. So the method, uh, the preferred method chosen uh, involved the last amount of uh, underwater cutting that was, that was feasible. So the plan was first to cut um, from the bulkhead of cargo hold one, um, uh, seen after was to cut all the uh, uh, structures above water and then what, on what remaining on the um, above water part to install on the hatch cover cargo hold one some chain pullers and then uh, the like the, the divers did like a straight cut uh, on the below the water line of cargo hold one and the chain pullers the chains were rigged onto the aft section rigged to chain pullers the chain pullers were action to lift 
uh, the the aft section, and so allowing uh, the the salvers to do dry cutting. And this was basically done uh, uh, until the section was completely removed. So it was rig pulling cut, rig pulling cut until all the section was gone, and then uh, like uh, with the crane barge alongside the wreck was also removed the the um, the forward section. Next slide, please. So this one was another one. Uh, so in the very sensitive areas, uh, the, the the reason why I included this case is because it was very um, it, like uh, the salvers had to deal with something that was not really part of of history of salvage or like modern history of salvage, which which was uh, the the uh, COVID pandemic. So this job was in Mauritius. So one of the main problems was for the salvers to actually get into the like onto the vessel. And because Mauritius is a small island, of course, they close down uh, to, to avoid anyone coming in. And of course, with this big ship uh, like breaking up, it was a very fine balance to allow people coming in to salvage the vessel, but also to not spread uh, COVID around, around the island. So it was a really interesting case also because of that. On the technical side, uh, the, uh, the, the, the wreck was exposed uh, to, to open water, uh, like to, to the full power of the ocean. So uh, the, the uh, aft section started taking water. The, the bunker tanks got breached in the news. It was mentioned that this was uh, a, a tanker because they, see, they saw like big ship and oil coming out, but it was a bulk carrier. Uh, eventually the ship broke in, in half, the uh, forward section got scuttled and uh, the, the, the part to be removed was the aft section. Uh, a contractor was appointed, and if I remember correctly, the salvage operation uh, lasted effectively lasted about like 40, 50 days, which is quite impressive. But because of the location, the operation were always down on weather. So these 50 days were uh, spread over two years time. So it was quite, quite challenging. So next slide, please. And then uh, this one, this was uh, my first job as a uh, naval architect, not as a consultant, but as a salvor. So, um, so here, the uh, the the um, there was a bulk carrier that crashed into a reef in the Maldives. So, as you can imagine, a very sensitive, environmentally sensitive area. So, the priority was to avoid an oil spill. So, and the solution that the salvage master found is to. Uh, basically close or like blind the wing tanks, uh, like the aft, some of the aft wing tanks and transfer the oil from the bottom tanks into the wing tanks. So to avoid that, uh, even if there was a bridge, uh, the, there will have been a, at least an air bubble that will have prevented uh, the oil from, from escaping, at least like uh, until the, the, uh, uh, the, the, the bridge will not, um, wasn't breaking the, the water surface. So at least that was prevented. And then uh, the first thing also, the other thing is that because the ship was exposed to weather, uh, the uh, the team made a call to ballast down the vessel, so to add more ballast to keep the vessel rock solid, grounded on the ground, because of course, if the vessel is too light, it might start rocking and that might create more damage. So, and of course, when the oil was removed, uh, the ballasting sequence had to begin. Uh, and of course, uh, I, as a naval architect, I dealt with the 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 uh, stability and and um, the ballasting uh, uh, sequence. And then, with the aid of two tags, the vessel was was pulled out. So it was a successful operation. Next slide, please. Uh, this one, a uh, smaller smaller wreck, uh, is a yacht. But the reason why I put this into into the uh, presentation is because, uh, of course, like if wreck has to be removed in uh, in the in a safely manner, but also to avoid any environmental uh, damage. But also uh, sometimes there's, there's a requirement that there must be uh, um, a forensic investigation being carried out. So sometimes it's important also not just to remove the vessel in this in a safely manner, but also to preserve the 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 wreck for a forensic investigation. And this was definitely the case um, for this yacht in, in France. Uh, next slide, please. And this is the last one. So this was another one with, which I was um, uh, employed as uh, part of the salvage team as a naval architect. So my role was to 
um, calculate the stability of the vessel. Uh, and of course, it was the principle to reflow the vessel was pretty, pretty simple, just put some airbags around it. Uh, one of the challenges that, that we, we face uh, here, uh, it was uh, still, there was still COVID around. So there was still some, some uh, testing required, but at least uh, the, the salvors could go out immediately. But the issue is that Mauritius is a remote island of the coast of Africa. Uh, so uh, to get all the equipment there, it was not the easiest. So even like for, for airbags, it was quite complicated to, to, to get them. Uh, but then eventually uh, we we got them, uh, we installed them around the vessel. Uh, then again, uh, I provide the the calculations. Uh, there was a lot of unknowns, so like where is the center of gravity in in this one? Uh, like one of the the the, the challenges that that um, an naval architect might face to determine stability. But then eventually, yeah, it was removed. Uh, of course, again, uh, some of the of the commuting, let's say, was done by by helicopter. And then it's me, thumbs up with what I like to call my salvage beer, uh, which, uh, yeah, I like to grow on every job. And next slide. And now we finish up with the conclusion. So the role of the naval architect in marine salvage is to provide engineering support in emergency response situation and wreck removals, to deliver quick and complex technical assessments to different stakeholders at different levels, but also to have a commercial and contractual understanding on how the salvage industry operates. This will have an impact to a technical and operational level. And I'm done. Thank you very much. Any questions now? So we'll open the, the floor to questions. Do the questions in the room first? We've got some online. Uh, yes, so uh, for those of you online, if you could type your question into the QA box, I'll read your question out and then they can answer it. Um, but we can start off in the room and then we'll try to ask any questions. Any questions from the floor? I have a question. When you talk Watch about it. The, uh, <laughs> the legislation in place, it, uh, it uh, works for all the world or it's only a UK? Right? legislation no so uh it, it really like it's a it's a lawyer question so uh like so the, the the thing that i can say is that contracts usually establish like a jurisdiction so an lof as uh, a uk jurisdiction and the arbitration uh court is london so that's defined in the contract so that doesn't like if it's an lof it means that if a job is in i don't know uh indonesia but it's uh, under an LOF that's uh, specified as uh, British legislation, so that will uh, UK law will will apply. But that's on on the contract side. Uh, then, to be honest, uh, about you know pure pure salvage, just like with salvage uh, for Article Thirteen awards and so on and so forth, uh, a lawyer might be uh, most more suitable for that. Like uh, for from my side, I'm definitely I provide technical. Uh, services, technical consultancy, but definitely I need to have an awareness and understanding of also like the commercial and contractual part on what's involved, because definitely that will have an impact on the technical side and, and vice versa. Technical side might uh, my, uh, be more advantage or advantages or uh, sorry, uh, more um, like could be better or, or worse in, based on the clauses involved. So definitely the two things are not separated, but like are really much correlated. So like from, from my side as a consultant, it's really important to have an understanding of, of all of this. Although like for that part of things, the lawyers are uh, much more suitable for, for that side. I hope this answered the question. Yeah. We have uh, had some questions online. All right. Uh, so the first one is, uh, to what degree of accuracy would you be expected to calculate a uh, center of gravity? Is your data from the build or is it uh, That's an excellent question. So the first thing is uh, what a salvo will do is asking the, uh, the, uh, the departure condition. So to have a baseline, to be like, you know, okay, we know, that that was the uh you know usually you have a a, a, a stability printout 
Uh, so you are able to define at least that and that you compare with the situation that you actually have. So for example, if there's a heavy listing uh, and then, you know, with the assessment that the cell board on board, my, my carry out can be like, you know, okay, this, this water ballast tank is floated, this cargo hold ballast uh, is floated. So then in the software, you put, you put everything and uh, you put the, uh, usually what I, I did in the past is creating the model then put in the stability conditions or center of gravity of the vessel uh, uh, in, for the departure condition. And then based on the information uh, that, that uh, someone received by the salvors on board the vessel, basically try to recreate the same the same condition to have uh, a, a stability an idea of the uh, stability condition of the vessel. So usually it's really, really important to have the pre-departure or departure um, uh, stability condition. Uh Thank you. So the, the next question, I suppose, really is a bit of a follow-up to the last one. Mm. It's, could you please explain more about the stability check process as a naval architect? What's the major difficulty? Well, definitely it's to get the uh, pre-departure stability condition, uh, because usually the thing is that uh, uh, it, it, it depends like from case by case. But uh, usually the one of the, the trickiest part is to get all the information that you need. So uh, sometimes you really have to do educated guesses, uh, but sometimes uh, you, you really uh, yeah, need to get uh, the, 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 uh, the, the appropriate information to create like a, 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 uh, like a close to reality was the reality model. So definitely, uh, I would say again, same answer, the uh, the, the pre-departure condition is really critical to then establish what the actual condition is, because at least that's the baseline. Thank you. Um, the next question is, uh, well, first is a thank you. For All right, question. thank you. And then, would a salvo be liable for any environmental damage as a result of salvage information? That's to, to be honest, that's a very interesting and very good question, which I will not answer because this is very like a lawyery uh question. So and I don't want to even attempt to answer that. So I will I'm sorry, but that, that's definitely for, for so a lawyer. Conclude it's for the courts to answer. Exactly. Beautifully put. Beautifully put. Okay. Um so the Next question is, uh, what stability software do you use? And also what software do you use for structural calculation? So usually uh, in, in emergency response situation, I use GHS. Uh, and now we have also, there's another software called Hexalf. Uh, and for a structural strength, uh, usually what I do is taking the stability booklet and then comparing the allowable uh, sharing forces and bending moments uh, to the condition that I have. Uh, usually I get, you know, if I get the, um, um, the um, uh, what's it called, the weight distribution curve, I can establish the condition. And then, of course, like where the tanks are loaded, where the cargo is, and where the grounding points are, because that definitely has an impact on the shearing forces and bending moments. And then put everything there into the, the software. And then we'll speed out some, some results and compare that with the uh, stability booklet, which will have the allowable limits for bending uh, moments and shearing forces. Follow on mm. How do you account for structural damage to the ship when you assess the longitudinal strength? Because obviously those limits are based on an intact ship. Yeah, uh, that's usually uh, from my my understanding. Because again, uh, luckily I never. Uh, on, on big ships, I never had to be the, the naval architect of the salvage team when there's a big hole. Um, but usually my understanding is that that's given by experience. So usually it's really uh, quick and dirty, put some reinforcement plates uh, and try to reinforce the section because the only way to establish a st uh, strength of a damaged section will be thermal analysis, which is not really, I mean, if you if you want to do it properly, uh, but then uh, it, it really sometimes it's like a really emergency response situation. So it's um, it's really to to try to reinforce the, the the section as much as you can, or you can subscribe to some uh, <laughs> classification society uh, emergency response services, which they do exist. I'm sorry I didn't mention them, but it would have been uh, too uh, too much of a long uh, of a presentation. So 
I hope I hope this answer the question. That mention of class, uh, yeah, class and response <laughs> services is quite uh, well timed. We have a question. How do you go? Uh, which is uh, when dealing calculations, um, can the yeah. salva work alongside ship and notice response service provided by class as they would be contacted often before the salvers anyway and would have things like the departure condition? So again, this is like I never experienced from this um, salvor side. Uh, so I don't really want to, to give it a definite answer. My understanding is that salvors they they will contact uh if uh it's the the like in specific emergency response situation they will they will reach out to to the emergency response services of classification society but that's again uh it depends from a case by case uh um basis so it, it really is every every job by my look uh, uh like unique to to the other so uh it really depends from from the situation and and the team involved um I'll ask some more questions. Mm, keep coming. Uh, the next question is um, so when you're doing your your basic calculation, yeah. you're comparing against the departure condition, for example, yeah. and you're you, you're using your model, mm -hmm. how do you make sure that that's validated? How do you know it's reasonably accurate? For example, things like points and distribution. That, that's that's an amazing question. The the only like you can only work with the uh the best information that you have so it's an emergency response situation it's really uh like what i like to describe is that it's salvage you need to to reverse engineering everything so for a construction project like for example if you want to build a ship you control the environment where you build in the ship the shipyard you know uh how many people you will have to build this you know how like you know the timeline on when each phases will be actionable in an emergency response situation and wreck removals, you need to build the same concept, but around the the final, what will be considered in other cases, the final product. So like where, wherever is the ship is crashing or wherever the wreck is, is has to be removed, you need to work around it. And and you can only do uh, so so much in terms of you know engineering and and there's a lot of educated guests and and you know a lot of experience so it, it, it's really it, it's quite uh, a unique unique industry because it's like almost nothing like it. You welcome. Um, I have another question. Uh, have you had, had a case where there was no students available? And if so, what difficulties with this course? I mean, I don't expect that efficient person to be Precisely. So the thing is that sometimes um, you might ask for, you know, uh, like the basis to create like a quick uh, a model is like the lines plan. And then you get the uh, uh, um, the um, tank arrangement uh, and, and things like this. So it might be that sometimes, especially for, for a smaller vessel, you get drawings that are not for that ship. So, for example, that ship had a bulbous bow, and we got drawings that were not for a bulbous bow, and the number of water ballast tanks were different, and so on and so forth. So, again, you can only work with what you have. So, of course, you're not going to be stubborn and, and just create a model that doesn't correspond to reality. It has to be um, kind of like a compromise. So, of course, you're going to start from the base of a similar vessel. And there you will try to mimic the 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 real uh, condition. But again, it's only based on the information that you have and the best thing, thing that you can that you can do in the limited time that that you have. So again, uh, like sometimes, uh, like you know, talking, uh, you know, when I started salvage, it was really impressive because. Uh, you know, a lot of things were not going as as a like construction industry, for example, like the, the informations are not there, are very limited. And again, you need to build the operation around uh, a, a, a ship, a wreck, that it's something that that the other industry, they do not do that. They have control on the environment, control on the timeline, which uh, in, in salvage is exactly the opposite. You don't have control on the environment. You don't have control on the timeline. You just need to consider that and work around it. Um, so the next question, um, I suppose, is to do with uh, offloading cargo. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you feel like you have a container ship and it's got quite a, a large angle mm -hmm. field, and um, what difficulties would there be in offloading containers? I mean, do they get stuck in the twist locks, for example? Or would you yeah, get them off? Definitely. So um, 
to to be honest, like I got just one case uh, that it was required like an offloading of containers from a wreck, and the listing luckily wasn't that bad. Uh, but my understanding is that by by crane and then uh, the twist locks might be cutted, uh, and uh, you know you you rig the, the the containers to avoid them uh, starting moving. Uh, um, I, all of a sudden but again uh this is something more for the the, the salvage master like a more on the practical level uh than than on the novel architect side because then again uh you you need to work around it so you cannot you cannot have the best mm -hmm. case scenario you just have to deal with the scenario that you have so the the answer might might differ from case by case but usually is uh worst case scenario is by the using like an external uh floating crane um Oh, another question for me. Uh, right. What sources of on site information do you get? You mentioned grounding points. Is this all visual from the surface or do you dive to after information? How often are salvages worth more time sensitive? And is it the role of the naval architect to assess risk to damage it in these situations? Or is it for the salvage master to uh, put it in Oh, that, that's a fantastic question. So, about grounding points, well, we do both. So usually uh, it depends also on the casualty. Sometimes, you know, you can actually see with your naked eye the grounding point because it's above water. And other times it's just the, a, a dive report that are uh, telling you where the ship is touching. And then it's the, it's an estimate. Again, even in the softwares, you know, I know for a fact like GHS, uh, the grounding points usually they're um, uh, designed for you know, a, a dry dock situation, but then they can apply to salvage. And again, this is like, it's not an exact science, unfortunately. So it's like really uh, on the on the visual side. Uh, and then regarding the salvage master and our architect uh, uh, responsibilities, uh, my understanding is that usually the salvage master is dealing on the operational level and they say, okay, we have this, 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 and we can do this, this, and that. And then the naval architect will try to back up what the, the plan is with the engineering. And, and, you know, if something is not feasible because the numbers are not there, uh, that's the role of the naval architect. But it's a strict uh, collaboration of, of the two. Um, so, yeah. Thank you. Um so we currently have no further questions online. Right. Do we have any more in the room? Okay. Oh, yes. Please speak loudly so the microphone can be Um. Yeah, that's a really good presentation. Thank you. Um, obviously, what you showed at the beginning there looked like there was a lot of bureaucracy involved with lawyers and everything like yeah. that. And then salvage is times against the clock. Mm -hmm. as long as you leave the wreck there, but uh, yeah. Do you find that's a problem that bureaucracy gets in the way that things really drag out to the point where the salvage becomes that that that's that's a fantastic question because that's what like in the salvage industry everyone is talking about so you know for example the lof i will try to to get like maybe in a in a sleepway slow because is this is more for the lawyers but usually the the discussion is that the lof is an emergency contract is an open contract so being an open contract it's uh it's can be really really expensive because you not you don't know how much you are going to end up paying so sometimes now even the like shipping lawyers specialized in salvage, they have an emergency response number 24 seven. So uh, uh, the, like the, it might be that in some cases, the, the lawyer can advise you know, on a better type of contract. For example, if just the tow is required to salvage the vessel, if the ship, if the ship lost power you know, and it's like in deep waters, so it's just like rolling around. It might be that just like a tag, uh, uh, just like a tag assistance. So, and that, uh, you know, back in the days when there was no communication, uh, it might have been signed and, and LOF, but now there's like, like there's a contract for tags, which are specifically they assist in towing the vessel into, into a safe, into a safe place. And that contract has no claim for salvage. So they agree on the price to do that service, which, theoretically might be considered salvage but the contract says you cannot claim uh for for salvage so it, it's a it's an ongoing discussions about you know people that are afraid uh of the lof because it might be an you know a very very expensive uh contract but then sometimes is the only way uh to to go forward so definitely there's an open open discussion and definitely there's a lot of people bringing a lot to the table uh 
but yeah, it, it's uh, sometimes there's uh, the, the risk is that there's a lot of uh, um, uh, like discussions and, and things like this, which actually it will be much easier to 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 go out there. But that that's definitely the chicken and the egg of the modern salvage industry. Everyone is talking about that. So that was a great question. I believe there was a second question. Yeah, thank you. And I think Simon actually wrote an answer. What happened? I'll put it slightly different. You're going to have to move the point straight back to the inside of the main report. You've got some key numbers. With the contacts, for instance, where they always open the port and first sees the others, I'm curious, on an operational point of view, commercial point of view, ground, when you see the system deployed out still expecting there were instructions as Salvo and Salvage Consultant, and mm -hmm. I'm asking one in terms of few years ago now and there was the noise threat of the average arbitration part of it. There was a pushback from the industry mm -hmm. of the, the potential risk of removing the option of having that emergency noise open for mm -hmm. that. So I was kind of curious from your experience on the ground, where do you see that difference whether it's under an LOF or under something else? Well, that's a great question, and and you made a valid point that there was this this talking about closing down the the salvage arbitration branch. Again, I I I am afraid that like I will push back on this question because it's like quite quite legal. So and again, during the salvage operation, there's this awareness that like all these things are going into the background, but then when you are actually on site, you're focused on the on the technical on the technical part. At least when I'm talking about the the uh so, like being a, like on the on the salvage side of things uh that like when all you're on the consultancy side of things you might be more aware on on the uh, commercial uh, um, uh magic that is going behind behind the scene uh but definitely again as a, as a technical consultant it's really important to have an understanding and be able to understand that these are things that are going are going on and like being discussed but really is uh, uh, the bread and butter of lawyers specialized in salvage. So I'm, I'm afraid I cannot, I cannot answer that question. Are there any more questions? No, uh, there are none online, so I think we can do right. that. Yeah, thank you very much. I think um, thank you. we have to include at some point in the next lecture series a salvage lawyer. To, yeah, exactly, uh, exactly. Exactly. Well, thank you very much. Our next meeting is...